Good evening. Uh, welcome to Johnson Chapel, I think, for the first time for many of you. Um, it's amazing to see so many people, you know, indoors. That was for me, huh? Uh, my name is Nishi Shaw. I'm a philosophy professor and one of the instructors in the progress question mark uh, first year seminar. This event's the first in this fall's Point Counterpoint series, organized by Professors Lawrence Douglas, Alexander George, and myself. And this series is made possible by a gift from members of the 50th reunion class of 1970. Um, we'd like to thank all of you for abiding by the COVID protocols, the staff who administered the COVID testing program, and all of the folks who put this wonderful event together including the Office of Communications, Conferences and Special Events, the First Year Seminar Committee, and the President's Office and Presidential Scholars Committee. Fourteen months ago, spurred by the protests over police violence against black people, President Martin wrote a letter to our community calling on us to reckon with our own racial history at Amherst College. She included in her letter a comprehensive plan for creating a campus in which all of us can learn, work, and live free from the indignities of racial discrimination and the threat of racial violence. Tonight's event is part of the curricular portion of that plan, specifically the first year seminar curriculum. We're lucky enough to have with us two of the leading lights on issues of identity and race to discuss what it might mean to come to terms with our racial past, whether that be giving reparations to descendants of those who were enslaved or harmed by other racially discriminatory practices, taking down monuments, commemorating slave owners, Confederate soldiers, or others who actively opposed racial equality. These are difficult and controversial issues. Given that both of our speakers are original thinkers, not given to orthodox positions, I expect that some of our assumptions about race and achieving anti-racist goals may be upended in the course of our conversation. This is as it should be, given that the Point Counterpoint series was put in place so that we might learn from perspectives not well represented within our own academic community. The rationale for the series was articulated over 160 years ago by the English philosopher John Stuart Mill. In his famous essay on liberty, Mill wrote, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. His reasons may be good and no one may be able to refute them, but if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not so much as know what they are, he has no ground for preferring either opinion. Nor is it enough that he should hear the arguments of adversaries from his own teachers, presented as they state them and accompanied by what they offer as refutations. This is not the way to do justice to the arguments or bring them into real contact with his own mind. He must be able to hear them from persons who actually believe them, who defend them in earnest and do their very utmost for them. He must know them in their most plausible and persuasive form. The very worth of our opinions, Mill tells us, depends on our willingness to listen to unfamiliar and even uncomfortable opinions from those who actually believe them. Let me now all too briefly introduce our two distinguished speakers, Professors Anthony Appia and Adolph Reed. So this is gonna be a brief intro to them um, and I hope you'll get to know them better through our conversation. 
Professor Appiah, a renowned public intellectual and professor of philosophy and law at NYU, who Forbes magazine has placed on a list of the world's seven most powerful thinkers, combines the curiosity, precision, and desire to look at old issues afresh, characteristic of at least what I'd like to think of as a philosopher, the prodigious and systematic knowledge of the past, characteristic of a historian, and the ability to sympathize with the multitude of perspectives, characteristic of a humanist. These talents allow him to join historical narratives with rigorous analysis to identify the myths and obscurities that surround race, gender, class, and other identities, and to make powerful, cogent, and fair-minded arguments about the legitimate significance of our identities. He's the author of numerous books and essays, including, most recently, the already hugely influential The Lies That Bind, Rethinking Identity, and also a book I hope we'll discuss, The Honor Code, which is a brilliant examination of the conditions that make for moral revolutions. Professor Reed, a professor emeritus of political science at the University of Pennsylvania, who Cornell West recently described as the greatest democratic theorist of his generation, combines the seriousness of moral purpose of a grassroots political activist, the depth of analysis of a social theorist, and the sharp, even cutting insights and witty prose of a literary critic. These talents allow him to produce penetrating and provocative, unmasking critiques of orthodox liberal views on race and to make a case for the fundamental role that class should play in an accurate understanding of social reality and in a truly progressive politics. Among his many writings, I'd like to highlight two. Class Notes, Posing as Politics, a brilliant, piercing series of essays on the pathologies of left-wing intellectuals, problems that stem from their alienation from the people they claim to represent. And his recent essay, The Trouble with Disparity, which forcefully argues that if we want to achieve racial justice, we ought to attend to class inequality. Okay, our conversation will last roughly 45 minutes, after which we'll take a few questions from you. There are microphones on, I think, both sides. Um, maybe right before the last question, I'll mention that you might, if you have a question, you might wanna get up to the podium before, at, during the last question. Um, okay, so without further ado, Please join me in welcoming our two guests. So what do you guys want to talk about? <laughs> Not the weather. Not baseball. the weather. Baseball. <laughs> yeah. Well, but the Red Sox are gone. Yay. <laughs> um, before we get into the difficult issues about race, I thought we'd start with a bit of a personal question, maybe to get to know you guys a little better. Um, since we have a bunch of students here in their first semester of college, I thought I'd ask you about what your first semester of college or maybe your first year of college was like. Uh, why don't we start with, you want to try it? Professor Reed? Sure. Um, yeah, yeah, mine was not a happy time, but I <laughs> suspect that that's true for most freshmen. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, in fact, over dinner, like I was recalling uh, you know, that the clerical and technical workers at Yale went on strike in 1984, and like, during the strike, the students were more, less sympathetic to the workers than the faculty were, which was odd. For, for someone coming out of the 60s, but, but one case in particular was a freshman who was quoted bemoaning the fact that the, you know, the university administration and the union had ruined what was supposed to be the best year of his life. And I thought, 
Since when is your freshman year in college <laughs> right, supposed to be the best year of your life? Uh, but, but, but in my case, uh, the circumstances were a little idiosyncratic. Uh, I was young, uh, and I was not especially um, mature for my age. And I went to college um, partly at a university I won't name, but partly like on an athletic scholarship and went there instead of the kind of liberal arts college that my mother wanted me to go to because of the athletic scholarship. Uh, but to add to the mix, I was like the first black, one of the first three black students to attend the university. And that carried its own burdens with it, not from the administration, everybody was, you know, was quite gracious, but uh, from some of my fellow students, like even a couple of people in my dorm who had seen me around, I played like intramural sports against them, and this one guy saw me walking out of my dorm room checking my wallet for my activity uh, um, packet, like to go to uh, the football game across the street, was convinced that I was an interloper and, and had stolen my own wallet. <laughs> And, and he says to me, I, I, I know this guy, you know, not him. So anyway, uh, so there were a couple of things li li like that, but I think a lot of it had to do with my uh, lack of maturity, right? Like days of being up all night and then, and then uh, I'm sleeping through my 8, 8 a.m. physanthro class and then waking up to go to track practice. But uh, so, so, so it was a rough time. And, and I left after a year and went um, to the institution where I wound up, you know, for good, and had my really formative uh, you know, political and, and intellectual experiences uh, just from being in the right place at the right time. And, and as I've often said, as you've heard me say probably half a dozen times in the last two days, it, it's often better to be in the right place at, at, at the right time and pay attention than it is to be smart. So <laughs> I survived. Uh, um, a dubious freshman year by going to the right place at the right time and paying attention. And that's my story. Um, so I went, to, uh, I went to college to be a doctor uh, uh, in England. And uh, in England, uh, if you want to be a doctor, you have to do medical sciences as an undergraduate. So I arrived at the age of 18. And my first week in college, I was presented with a corpse uh, which, which I and three other people were supposed to spend the year discovering the insides of uh, uh, and uh, learning um, anatomy. Um, uh, also was introduced to the practice of doing experiments on decerebrate rabbits. Mm. Um, now, I'm a pretty squeamish guy, so neither of these experiences was very, was very friendly for me. Um, and it became clear to me pretty soon that I was in the wrong business. Um, but the way the university worked, I couldn't get out of medicine without doing the first year medical exam. So even though I knew that I didn't really want to do this thing, and I had to stick around. So one of the options in the medical sciences degree at Cambridge was, um, was you could do history and philosophy of science. That mm. was the only thing that wasn't science. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I thought, well, at least I can go to some lectures. Uh, and, um, and I enjoyed those. So, I, uh, so by the time I got to the end of the year and got, uh, passed with the lowest possible passing grade in uh, my um, medical exams, uh, I actually, uh, in one of the, in the anatomy exam, oral exam, uh, I was examined by a member of the anatomy department of Cambridge University and a visiting uh, examiner who was from Oxford. And they presented me with a bone and asked me what it was. Now, there are only a couple of hundred bones in the human body, so I should have known the answer. But I said, um, I said, uh, could it be, you know, something from the shoulder? And the, <laughs> <laughs> and the, the guy from Oxford said, try the other end of the body. <laughs> uh, so I, I think they passed me because they knew I was going to stop doing medicine. And, <laughs> I had been saved from the disaster of my uh, brief medical career by the fact that I was able to do these philosophy lectures. And my college permitted me, they didn't have to, but they very kindly permitted me to, to turn from medicine to the study of philosophy, which I had already uh, knew 
uh, I, I loved from having spent time reading philosophy in high school. And so um, I was saved from my disastrous first year as a freshman by um, the discovery of philosophy. And I remember the, um, the summer between my freshman year and my second year in college, uh, I read uh, John Rawls's A Theory of Justice, which uh, I'm old enough that that was a new book at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I think it had come out the year before. And uh, I thought, hmm, yes, this is, this is better than uh, exploring the activities of the vagus nerve of, of uh, rabbits whose brains have been destroyed or trying to figure out the root of the passage <laughs> of the internal inguinal artery. Uh, and uh, and th then I was saved. So, so there's hope for you all. <laughs> <laughs> so you how, it, however it goes, you'll be fine. Right, right, that's right. <laughs> and you should think about philosophy. It <laughs> saved him. All right. All right. Um, so let's talk about race, or maybe we won't. Um, both of you, I think, have argued fairly forcefully that in some sense, race is a myth. So I was wondering if each of you could maybe explain what you meant by that and maybe what you think the significance of that is, if it really is true. Maybe we'll start with Professor yeah. Appiah. Um, so, uh, actually, my, my sort of brief exposure to bi biology <laughs> is sort of relevant here, yeah. because um, when I, um, so w we were assistant professors together <laughs> at Yale uh, yeah. uh, in the late Paleolithic, and, um, <laughs> um, and I was, a, I, my, this was my first job, and I was appointed in African American Studies and Philosophy. And I think I may have been the first person in the world to be appointed in African American Studies <laughs> and Philosophy, because yeah. I don't think there were many, uh, African American Studies was very much a sort of social science thing at that point. Right. The, the, the rise of humanistic work in the social sciences, in, in, in African American studies, really begins about the, in, the, in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And actually, Yale was one of the places, through the work of people like Skip Gates and Robert right. Steptoe, where the explosion of interest in um, African American literature uh, really uh, took off. I mean, of course, it's, it was being studied all along in lots of places, but, but there was a really big takeoff at that point. Um, and so I arrived, and since I had this job, uh, and since nobody had had this, this job or any job like it before, it wasn't entirely clear what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> so I thought, what, what, what can I usefully contribute to this amazing intellectual enterprise, the enterprise of thinking about uh, race in America and in the world? And I thought, well, you know, I, sh I should be able to find in the literature, I should be able to go into literature, and there should be lots of stuff by philosophers about race. Basically nothing. A uh, little bit about racism, but mostly uh, the stuff about racism was not very good. Uh, it, well, not very helpful, I didn't think. Um, so I thought, okay, this is great. I've, been, I've got this tabula rasa. I've got this empty field. There's almost <laughs> nothing there yep. uh, that's currently of interest to, to the kind of person with my kind of philosophical training, analytic philosophers. Um, though I wouldn't, I wouldn't call myself that anymore, but that was my training. So. Uh, and I knew, since I had spent a lot of time being a biologist uh, in order to get into medical school and had studied uh, evolutionary biology, because you know, Darwinism is the central organizing mm -hmm. theory of modern biology, uh, along with genomics and genetics, um, I, I knew that in the sciences, in, in, the, in, the, in the biological sciences, people didn't use this notion in a serious way, that it had been subjected to relentless critique by anthropologists, physical anthropologists, social anthropologists, cultural anthropologists, biologists, geneticists. They didn't, they didn't want it. So I arrived in the United States in a Department of African American Studies, and people are talking to me as if they think that this is some thing inscribed in people's bodies by nature or God or something. Right. And I just think, well, that's interesting. That doesn't seem right to me. That doesn't so it was that thought, that thought that um, these social divisions by race were grounded in some kind of objective set of biological differences between people. That thought just seemed to me, it, it wasn't philosophically wrong. It was just terrible science, as far as I could see. Uh, and I checked, and I went back, and I looked in the, in the science journals. I looked in books of the evolutionary 
in journals of evolutionary stuff. And indeed, I was, I was right. Uh, that there, were, there were good arguments against all of this. So the first thing I was saying when I s said that race was a myth was that the, the, the myth was that these social categories that were, of course, incredibly important in, 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 in the organization of society, the myth was that these were grounded in a, in a sort of objective reality. Now notice that even if that had been true, it would not have been appropriate <laughs> to use those categories as the basis of oppression or insult. Uh, so it, it's not necessary to be opposed to racism to grasp that the race concept is, um, is a farrago of, of mistakes. Mm -hmm. But I think, I thought then, at least, that it was helpful, at least, to point that out, to say, look, whatever this, whatever this is, don't, don't blame nature, don't blame God, uh, we made it. And that has one, uh, for me, at that point, anyway, that had one important consequence, which was that if we make, make it, we can unmake it. We, we don't have to do things this way. Uh, we don't have to think of the world as divided in these ways. So that was, the, that was my first sort of thought. So when I said in an essay that got me into a lot of trouble, that, right. <laughs> which was called The Illusion of Race. And oh, I was a big fan. <laughs> yeah, well, of course. <laughs> but, you know, we were, we were on the, I don't think we were in the majority by any means. <laughs> I think not. Uh, even, <laughs> I mean, even among uh, scholars, mm -hmm. ne never mind in the general population, I think, I think this was thought to be... Um, one thing that people thought was they didn't believe I, they didn't believe I believed it. They thought I was just saying this. They thought this was what is now called political correctness, that you were, you were saying, oh, this isn't real, because, you thought that, because I thought that if it wasn't real, uh, somehow that would help with, with racism. Right. But that really, I'm afraid, my, my thought was this very simple, um, almost, I would say, scientific thought. The thought was, look, right. the, the scientists have looked into it, and they haven't come back with a message uh, that this is, this is there. This, these distinctions are not there in the world. And once you see that, then of course you can think, look, whatever the explanation is for any connection between the social categories of race and anything else, intelligence, um, uh, health, stuff like that, it's most likely that the explanation is a social <laughs> explanation. It's most likely that if you look at the differences in health, dis disparities in, in, in healthcare, outcomes for black and white people in the pandemic. It's most likely that that has to do with the different social experiences of, of uh, uh, inequality uh, and unequal access to healthcare and different treatment by the healthcare system, right? And reasonable skepticism on the part of some black communities about the, the, the intentions of the official healthcare system, which is a healthcare system that, you know, in the past um, allowed uh, black men in Tuskegee to live for years with syphilis in order to see what happens with syphilis, and so on. So anyway, uh, so, so the, thought, the, the first thought is just, look, this is not what you think it is. That's the myth. Yeah, I had a slightly different route to the same place, basically, at the same time, obviously. Mm. Um, but so like, part of it is, um, so my early interest was in the history of ideology, or my early academic interest, and it's my late academic interest too. Uh, but when I was an undergraduate, I majored in political science, I had a double major in social, but I had uh, one course short of, of enough credit for a major in anthropology. And, I, and, and I've always considered myself a kind of um, an anthropologically in, informed historian of ideologies, right? So as part of that, um, um, I began, because you know, for reasons that it would make sense like for anyone to be skeptical of a notion like, like, you know, like race, um, I um, confirmed pretty early on that there are uh, you know, no uh, sub, subspecies level differences among human populations, or, there's, or, 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 or there are no um, chartable what I mean, differences between large, large, large groups of human populations uh, you know, between the level of the species and the level of the local breeding group, right? So that immediately then this sort of calls, calls the race idea like into question. And then examination and history of thought 
right, uh, about the genesis of, of the race notion. And uh, well, uh, so, you know, kind of um, pushed me farther, right, I mean, down that road. And then I began at, at, at some point like, to recognize, well, you know, the work that race does. And like I'll add like, like a parenthetical, uh, I have family roots, I mean, not only in Cuba, but also in, in South Louisiana. And if, 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 if there are any two places in, in the world, <laughs> right, that, that show the folly of, of the race idea, like it's those two. So, it's, so I mean, once again, yeah, I'm in the right place at the right time and paid attention. So, and, and often again, that's better than being smart. Um, so, um, but I began then, um, I guess around the time that we, that, and we were assistant professors, thinking that, well, the social work or the ideological work that race does at, you know, as a category is kind of masking, right? But it's masking in a particular way, right? Uh, and then I began, like in concert with, with, the, with, with another, uh, uh, you know, my colleagues at Yale, who's also my colleague at Penn. But I mean, thinking about, you know, what we began to call, um, you know, discourses of, of, of ascriptive difference and, uh, and of hierarchy. And the sort of functionalist sounding foundation for this view is that um, hierarchically, when, uh, I mean, organized uh, I mean, social orders you know, don't depend just on coercion, right? They can't survive, right, right just on the basis of, of, of coercion. Uh, and what happens along the way, and it's kind of an evolutionist right account, though, though, though again, I apologize for the extent to which it seems functionalist, but is that you know, discourses um, um, emerge and become commonsensical to, to the extent that they harmonize with, with the worldviews of, you know, of the people who run things. Uh, that um, that contend that or, or that purport like to naturalize um, 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 existing patterns of hierarchy by basically arguing just those stories, right? That that what that the society is is functioning fine because everybody. So so, so the first uh, so so the first uh, the rhetorical move, right? It 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 is to taxonomize the population into categories which are then reified as groups, okay? And then, uh, having done that, then the next move is to attribute characteristics and features to the groups thus artificially constructed that explain why they are where they are in, in the social hierarchy, right? And from that perspective, and I think it's really important, like at this moment in particular, like at American intellectual life, uh, and frankly, in the political I mean, discourses that are predominant in uh, elite colleges at this point, um, you know, to keep in mind that race, well, this is my argument anyway, so I'm gonna lay it out there, I mean, whether you keep it in mind or not, uh, yeah. but, but that, the, that, 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 uh, but, but that the key notion here is, is the genus, right, to put it like in, in I mean, Darwinian terms, the genus of discourses of ascriptive hierarchy. And, and what those are, are, are just so stories that sort populations on the basis of what they supposedly are instead of what they do, right? So, of course, um, a Mexican does the yard work because you know, Mexicans have what, what would later be understood as the gene for yard work, right? <laughs> um, but, but, but I want to stress the genus because race is one species of that genus, but it's not the only one, right? I mean, gender is like another, obviously. Um, sexual orientation can be another. Um, um, in 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 uh, the U.S. in the 20s and the 30s, and this is one of the reasons I like what to study um, the eugenics movement is a feeble-mindedness or or inborn criminality, or you know, discourses that had the same power and force that we, we understand uh, race and gender to have. And I think if nothing else comes out of this evening, if six of you. Uh, because I'm looking at what well, the size of the crowd, and, and 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 I've spent my entire life lowering my expectations. But <laughs> but but if six of you going forward will keep in mind that race is not 
um, you, um, you know, the single, um, um, what, I mean, discourse of, of invidious difference that, that trumps everything else, no pun intended, then my work here will have been done. <laughs> <laughs> I ask just one follow-up, and you can give me that elevator pitch answer to this, just a flat-footed question. Like, the way you guys have described the concept of race, it reminds me of, like, the concept of a witch. Mm. I don't use the concept of a witch. Right. But we all use racial categories. You guys use racial categories. I do. Why haven't we thrown it out like we throw out the defective concept of a witch? You know, we don't say, that person's a witch, that person's not a witch. We don't cl classify um, people like that. We don't now. Right. But we're in right. Massachusetts. Right. <laughs> and, and you may recall <laughs> that, that we did. And, right. and I grew up in Ghana. Mm. I can assure you, uh, I'm involved with a, with a, um, a not-for-profit. One of the things it does is to, is to spend money on camps for women accused of witchcraft in northern mm. Ghana to keep them away from people who will otherwise beat them up or kill them. Um, in that context, it would be profoundly unhelpful not to recognize that there's a category of people to protect and that you might as well call them witches because everybody else is calling them witches, uh, even though I don't believe, obviously, in, in witchcraft. Um, so you need an account, of course, of what the categories are that are being used in social life. You have to understand them correctly, but you, of course you need them. And given the, the, the way our society is racially formed, you've got to have those languages. You've got to have some language to talk about these things because you've got to be able to do cr criticism. You've got to be able to keep track of uh, differential rates of, of imprisonment. You've got to be able, incarceration. You've got to be able to uh, show that cops approach people who are racialized one way. You know, th there's a nice study in the National Academy of, of Sciences uh, uh, proceedings, uh, which just looked at the cameras on the, mm -hmm. on the bodies of cops doing um, police car stops in, um, in I think in Oakland, in, in California. Cops, it doesn't matter what their, their racial identity is, mm -hmm. cops approach black drivers differently from the way they approach non-black drivers. You need a language to be able to talk about that. Right. <laughs> and you need to be able to name the people who are being racialized one way and treated one way, and the people who are being racialized in other, way, other ways and being treated in other ways. Of course, there are many, it's not just, it's not just two races. Um, so that's why we talk about it. Um, I usually, prefer to talk about racial identities just to keep right at the front of my mind as I'm thinking about it, that these are these socially produced categories. And these socially produced categories have certain properties. One of them is that um, once you see them that way, you don't have to have an answer to certain questions. So here's a question you don't need an answer to. Is so-and-so really black mm. or really white, right? You don't need an answer to that question. What you, what you, the question you need an answer to is, questions you need the answer to are, how are they being treated? How do they think of themselves? Who are they in solidarity with? I mean, there are lots of questions to ask. But, um, but because it is a myth, you're not obliged to have a correct an, an answer to the question, where exactly do the boundaries lie? And this is, this is not just the point about race, of course. I mean, we've just gone through a social process of learning how important it is not to think of the gender system as biologically binary and therefore, as it were, again, one of these things produced by nature. It's not produced by nature. Right. Nature plays a role in it, just as nature uh, plays a role in determining what color your skin is. But that's not what race is, and your sexual organs aren't what gender is. And so we need names of these things, and in careful analytical contexts, we need to um, we need to distinguish between committing yourself to a race thought and committing yourself to the idea that there are racial identities, for example. We need to do that. And I'll say one, one, one final thing. Um, these are, in our country, these identity notions are in use in struggles, in actual political struggles. One of the besetting sins of intellectuals in actual political struggles is fiddling around <laughs> with the technicalities of right. getting the stuff right rather than facing the big 
issue. So it's not helpful, in my view, uh, in the context of anti-racist struggles to spend too much time fussing about who's, who's what and what the correct account is of who's what. Uh, uh, um, du Bois once said, uh, W.B. Du Bois once said uh, uh, something like this, uh, the Negro knows his place, he is in it. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so, so you don't need, you, you know, uh, and Du Bois was a very sophisticated thinker about these questions and had, had, uh, had views about, uh, you know, all the things we've been talking about. So, yes, we have to talk about uh, concepts that are there. In the way in which in Ghana, I might as well just talk about witches because, Everyone as I say, there are, these, there are these women who will be dead if we don't do something to, to create camps where they can escape from the communities that are trying to kill them. Yeah, I mean, I would add, uh, um, but, but yeah, of course I agree completely, <clears throat> and I'll pick up you know, on the Du Bois point because I was just thinking about this, that, um, so in, the, in Dusk of Dawn, right, there's a chapter in which uh, you know, Du Bois uh, you know, lays out an apocryphal dialogue with, with a foreigner to whom he's trying to explain the race idea. And, 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 and he adduces one uh, definition uh, or one taxonomic Right, I mean, construction after another, and like, each one winds up being uh, what, um, 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 argued away, right? Uh, right all of the, uh, you know, the physical differences turn out to be chimerical, right? And, and, uh, and all the other abstract stuff. So finally, he um, says, 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 to the, says to the interlocutor is that um, a Negro or a black man, I forget which, frankly, is someone who must ride Jim Crow in, in Georgia, right? And that's like the quintessence of social constructionism, right? Uh, and, and, um, and, you know, like I, uh, a few years ago, during uh, you know, uh, uh, the Rachel Dolezal controversy, like I wrote an essay right about this, uh, uh, the, well, uh, I mean, the thrust of which was the contention that you can either accept Jenner's um, claim to be a woman <clears throat> and Dolezal's claim to be black, or you can reject them both, but you can't treat it like a smorgasbord. You can't accept one and, and, uh, and, and I mean, reject the other uh, because both are rooted in social constructions that 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 um, that defy uh, concrete what uh, yeah I mean definition right uh, and uh, and each calls forth what of each attempt to call forth like a definitive um, characteristic you also ca calls forth a big well according to whom right like who says right but but. Um, but I want to mention, too, like my other thought about this before Du Bois came up, was, well, was that I got into um, studying race, race ideology <clears throat> at, you know, in a direct way um, you know, at a very you know, particular moment. At the beginning of the 20th century, there was, uh, um, I mean, I know this is the, this is the chapel, but, uh, but can I say I'm an asshole? <laughs> you just uh, did. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, there was an asshole in California named Ward Connerly who, who was a right-wing um, operative, right, who um, had pushed a ballot initiative in this horrible uh, system that they, what they still have in the state of California that ironically was a product of a capital P, P progressive government. Uh, but uh, this ba ballot initiative was called the California Civil Rights um, um, Initiative, and the name was Orwellian. <clears throat> uh, so I learned uh, along the way that what this initiative would have done was prevent the state of California from keeping data by race, with two exceptions, criminal justice <laughs> and public health. So I thought, OK, well, y y you couldn't imagine a more ass-backward way to approach this, right? So I, you know, being the kind of you know, academic that I am, set out to write an op-ed for one of the California newspapers to point out what, what the folly of this notion. But I also thought that before I did that, I should check on the opposition's uh, 
website to see how they were playing it. And to my chagrin, um, I learned that in the public health section or tab of the opposition ballot, or, or I mean the opposition's website, um, they actually argued that Connerly's um, ballot initiative, if, if it passed, would make it Im impossible for us to track diseases that only we get. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, I can't write the op-ed piece now because it, would give aid, <laughs> because it could give aid and comfort right, right to the opposition. But that's what led me to think that this is like a deeper but, you know, intellectual problem that, has, that, that also clearly does a lot of political mischief. And, and I've been trying to work my way around it ever since. <clears throat> but, um, uh, but I guess the other thing, what I mean, that I would underscore is that it's very important for us you know, to make a distinction, as you pointed out, Anthony, between categories of practice, which is the way that we, that we all use race, right? And categories of, of, of analysis, right? <clears throat> and, and the trouble with confusing them it, it is, well, is loss of analytical clarity and, 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 and a precision. Uh, so I guess that's an answer, right? Or, well, well, yes, it's an answer, but is it an appropriate answer? <laughs> um, I want to ask both of you about, uh, each one of you about one of your writings. And I know we're sort of, we've only got about 15 or 20 minutes before I want to open it up to Oh, wow. To wow. <laughs> so, so like we really have. You guys have been talking. Oh, uh, yeah, we took the opening kickoff and ran out the clock. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll start with, um, with you, Professor Reed. So this is what we talked about this morning, but I, I think it'd be good to present this argument in front of a full house. Okay. So I'll put your thesis sort of paradoxically. This is the thesis of your paper, The Trouble with Disparity. Um, the thought is, if you really care about racial justice, about getting rid of racial disparities, like the racial wealth gap or the disparities with respect to the effects of COVID or the disparities with respect to pol police violence, you should stop focusing on race. That's the paradoxical version right. of the thesis. Do you yeah. want to explain that well, thesis sure. and the argument for it? Uh, yeah, I'll try. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, so I'll start out with, with the COVID disparities, right, since they're fresh for us all. <clears throat> um, and, and at the beginning, um, I suspect like a number of you, even, well, I mean, these are Amherst freshmen, so they're, they're not like really freshmen, they're already like, <laughs> well, right ahead of the game. <clears throat> um, but have noticed from pretty early on, right, that the, that, that the, that are the earliest of, of the reports about uh, where, uh, where infections and deaths were clustering took on a racial cast, right? You know, black people were infected at higher rates, uh, black people died at higher rates, and then other group, groups eventually began to, to, to join the party, basically. And my concern about this, especially as somebody who studies and teaches the history of race ideologies, was, that, oh my God, right? Uh, 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 you know, what, what's the potential here for mischief? And it seemed very, very great. And, 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 and in fact, it did not take very long um, and I think uh, you know, one of the first people to say it out in public what was a U.S. senator from the state of Louisiana, right, and where else, um, who suggested that, well, there's something about black biology, right, uh, that, that w w would explain the disparity. Um, and there were several factors that were worked there, right, well, one of which is that most public health data in, in the U.S. are not collected by income. Right, race and most public health research takes race as a proxy for class. So there's a, so there's a tautological right, aspect of this too. Right? When you look for race, you find race, and and that has been the history of of, 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 of race ideology since the 18th century. Right, when race ideology, um, Kendi and and Afro pessimist not, notwithstanding, was basically born in the 18th century. Right. Um, so, so there was that problem, right? But there's also like the misplaced concreteness, right? Um, so that the focus on racial disparities around COVID really led to a couple of uh, 
unhelpful um, sort of responses, one of which is the hand-wringing that the liberals do. Oh my God, so, right, um, this is bad. Blacks have it worse, blacks have it worse, right, and blacks have it worse, right? But which is not a political program, like it's an alternative <laughs> to a political program, right? Um, and, uh, but, but the other response um, was, was that, um, w what was it we've, was that it's set into motion, and like this is the second or third time in the last 30 years, right, that, that something has triggered this. It's set into motion debates about what it is about black people that, that you know, made them the particular targets. And when, you know, for those of us who, you know, once again, just pay a little bit of attention, right, uh, but, I mean, look at who brings the packages to you, for instance, right? I mean, look at who's taking a subway to work. We, we can see pretty clearly that race was a proxy for something else that was going on here. Eventually, right, well, with the research, catches up with, with the social reality, and it turns out that, well, actually, blacks and Hispanics are more susceptible and have worse outcomes because they work jobs that, that, that engaged them right out in public, that they were less likely to, to be able to sit home and schlep through this dystopian Shangri-La that we've all been able to do for the last year and a half. Um, they were more likely to live in crowded conditions. They were more likely not, not to have you know, access to health care. So it turns out that race was you know, not only um, a, a um, 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 a screen, but, but it's almost like a cover story, and sort of got in the way of making the kinds of arguments and, and the kinds of proposals that could actually have made people's lives better, right? So that's just COVID. Uh, like another one that, that I like to draw on, like it's old, right? I think the bulk of you, if I can count properly, were maybe only barely born like when Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast. But, but like in the early, days, months, weeks, right after the storm hit, <clears throat> the nation rediscovered <clears throat> racial inequality and injustice on the Gulf Coast and, 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 and in the city of New Orleans. Uh, one of my reactions was, well, I don't know, wh you know where you thought that that woman who turns down your bed cover in, in, in the French Quarter Hotel goes uh, when she gets off work, what kind of money she makes, whatever. But it turns out there, too, that the better predictor than, than race of, of infelicitous um, outcomes, like every step along the way, um, apart from being flooded and, and uh, displaced because the water, it, there's like an equal opportunity um, <laughs> threat. But from um, the terms of displacement to how long the displacement lasted to who was able to come back to, to the city and who wasn't, the best predictor at every point, point along the way was access to resources pr prior to the storm, right? And this is yet another way that race sort of clouds, um, you know, what the, what the actual sources or the actual mechanisms are that re reproduce inequality. Now, I'll say this about the disparity focus in, 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 in a particular. Uh, and this may feel provocative. It doesn't feel especially provocative to me, frankly, but, uh, but I mean, who am I? I don't count it as. Um, <clears throat> so we, we've been hearing a lot in the, you know, recent years about the racial wealth gap, right? Well, uh, well it turns out, well, um, well, but a couple of factual um, dynamics are, are, you know, are at work that are kind of interesting. One is, oh, so we also have, have, have heard that, that the racial income gap is exactly the same as it was in 1968, right? But when you decompose, you know, those gross um, data, right, you find a couple of things, th things that are interesting. One is that, um, well, the milder one, so I'll go with that first, is that, you know, with respect to the racial income gap, it turns out, actually, that between 1968 and, and 2016 or 17, um, you know, black Americans in the aggregate uh, had, had, had gained uh, in, in uh, income, right? They moved up, I think, nine or 10 um, deciles, or, or um, not deciles. Percentiles. Yeah, right. Um, 
but, but, that, but, but those gains were obscured or, or countermanded, basically, by the radical increase in overall of the income inequality, right? Um, so, so, so that the actual gains that black Americans had made in the economy, which frankly are gains that you would expect, once again, if you, you know, keep your eyes open, right, uh, and see black people who are working jobs that they wouldn't have worked before, uh, and, and in positions of authority, et cetera, et cetera. Um, captains in the fire department, for instance, which is the place I like to look, um, then you, you would wonder, well, 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 how can there be um, so much um, evidence uh, of improvement in living conditions and, and, and the middle class jobs and lifestyles among black people and, and the ratios of, of the black to white income haven't changed. Well, it turns out that, that, that the last 40 years plus at this point of, 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 of a political economic program that's focused on, on, on in, in encouraging a, a regressive economic re, uh, redistribution upward, right, to make rich people richer, is what g gives the impression that blacks haven't gained. And the problem, and that points to another problem, which is, um, again, uh, that's got, got to do with, with the fictive character of like the racial categories, because white people haven't gained either, right? Most, most whites, right? It's like rich, rich people are richer fabulously richer than they've ever been before, no matter what their color is, right? So that kind of leads us to the wealth gap, where things get a little more dramatic, right? Turns out, you know, decomposing the wealth gap data, and we've all, you know, seen how much, you know, blacks, blacks have like 2% of the wealth that whites have, whatever, whatever. Well, it turns out that 75% of so-called black wealth is, is held by the richest 10% of black people, and 75% of so-called white wealth is held by the richest 10% of white people. <clears throat> and that the bottom 50% of both blacks and whites have no wealth whatsoever, zero, punto, nothing, right? Um, and, and, and I think like the, the, um, that you can close, if you um, eliminate the wealth gap right, right between the bottom two thirds, I believe, of each category, because I'm not going to call them groups, right? Um, um, it, it turns out that over 97% of the wealth gap would remain. <clears throat> so what that means is the racial wealth gap is a wealth gap or is a gap between the wealth that rich black people hold and the wealth that rich white people hold. And, and so to put that in perspective, right, as a, you know, project to be concerned about. And what I think Amherst was like Williams years ago, uh, like back in the 80s, where like 60% of the graduating class, uh, what I'm a class every year, went to work on Wall Street. So now might be the time that I would need to have like a, a buffer, right? Like some wood. <laughs> but, 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 but the fact is that, you know, from, from, from an abstract standpoint of, of of notions of a just society, right? Um, a society of Beckerian, right, like equality of opportunity can be as defensible as, as any other. And that would be a society in, in, in which it would be possible, as uh, Walter Michaels and I put it often, that 1% of the population could, could control 90% of the resources, but, uh, but the society could be considered just if 12% of the 1% were black, if half, <laughs> if, if were half women, and 14% Hispanic or whatever. And that's a notion of a just world that is as defensible, uh, again, in the abstract, but as any other. And you know, from an institution where, I mean, 60% of the graduating class goes to Wall Street, that might seem like the state of nature, basically, <laughs> or heaven, but, um, <laughs> but, but one of its limitations, right, is that to the extent that one contends that pursuit of narrowing those, those gaps or, or those putative gaps 
and thus pursuit of the ideal of, of the Beccarian model of, uh, of a just society, to the extent that the defense of that strategy is to help black people or, or brown people, well, it doesn't work because a world in which 1% of the population controls, I mean, 90% of the stuff, even if 12% of that, of that 1% 1, 1 are, are black, say, would still leave the vast majority of black people, even more black people than is currently the case, um, at the bottom. Great. Um, I think instead of getting you to respond, maybe I'll ask Professor Oppie the question I wanted to ask about the honor code. Yep. So this is, I think, going to be our last question before we open it up to Q&A. So if you're thinking of asking a question, this might be a good time to get in the queue. Um, so I wanted to ask you about your book, The Honor Code, because in that book, you argue that when you look at the history of moral revolutions, like the end of dueling or the end of the Atlantic slave trade, um, what you see is that people could make moral arguments until they were blue in the face. Everyone knew the moral arguments, and you didn't get change. You needed some extra ingredient, either a sense of personal honor or maybe national honor, where that's a different notion than just a moral notion. And that was the sort of missing ingredient. And I was wondering both if you could just sort of explain that argument, but also whether you thought the civil rights movement would count as a case of moral revolution in the sense you have in mind, and if honor played a role in that, or whether we're in the midst of a moral revolution right now with respect to the various anti-racist measures. Um, yes, so the basic idea is this, that um, I looked at a, a, a number of cases, the end of foot binding in China, uh, the current movement against honor killing in Pakistan, um, mm -hmm. uh, the British working class abolitionism, and, um, uh, and dueling. And in each of them, uh, the, the central moral arguments are in place long before anything happens. Uh, uh, arguments against, mm -hmm. against slavery are as old as slavery, mm -hmm. but by the 18th century, right. there's just a whole slew of them. Right. And um, uh, the first criticisms of uh, foot binding in uh, China happened in the 11th century, <laughs> <laughs> which is about 100 years after it starts. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the first serious. Um, so the arguments are there. and, and and people know them, and, and, they're, some of them, and they're obvious, some of them. Uh, what could be in favor of a practice that involves causing intense pain to three-year-old girls? I mean, just described that way, it's obvious that there's an argument against it. Maybe there's something in its favor as well, <laughs> but right, just, you know. And it's not that people didn't know this. We have, we have accounts of literati who left their homes for six months while their daughter's feet were being bound because they couldn't stand the sound, the noise. It was too painful for them. So, um, so, so you've got all these moral arguments in place and nothing happens. Question, what, what, what does it take to make something happen? Well, in each of these cases, you get a social movement, abolitionism, anti-foot binding movements, uh, anti-honor killing campaigns, which in which people come to identify very, very deeply with the project. They think of themselves. They don't say, I'm in favor of abolition. They say, I'm an abolitionist. And they go to meetings with other abolitionists. Mm -hmm. In England, in the, um, in the late uh, 18th century, uh, ordinary people would go and listen for, for eight hours <laughs> to speeches, again. they would go to the local town, they would sit there, listen for eight hours to speech, speeches describing the horrible conditions in, in, um, in, in the Middle Passage, uh, or the horrible conditions on plantations in the West Indies or, or in the Americas. Why do you do that? Because you're deeply identified with the project. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you feel that you've got a stake in it, and the stake in each case is, depends on who you are, but the stake in the case of Britain was a central stake for working people was, slavery says that manual labor is to be done by a despised class of people. It's an attack on right. what was growing in the early 19th century in Britain, which was a very strong sense of uh, pride in 
working in, in being working class. Working class men's associations develop, they, they organize, they socialize, and above all, they resist the, uh, the sort of bourgeois and uh, upper class uh, stigmatization of the very thing that defines them. And so by the middle of the 19th century, um, th they, they mock the uselessness mm. of anybody who doesn't make anything, mm. who doesn't make anything, who isn't a worker, a, a manufacturer. So against that background, abolition is about expressing your own sense of, your, of, of, of the value of, who, of people of your kind. In the anti-footbinding case, um, it's, it's a sense of the pride of China in its, in its reputation in the community of nations and a sense that this practice um, leads other people properly to disrespect us. It's not just that they disrespect, we, who cares if other people don't disrespect you, but, but they, they are disrespecting you for something you know is wrong. Right, so it's that kind of investment in in it that gets people in social movements um, doing things. It's, it's a sense that I have a stake in this through something, through being working class. In the case of abolition, in British abolition, uh, in the case, but also in British abolition, uh, there were people who were proud as citizens of Manchester to be fighting the slave trade, and they sent they they were proud because they sent the largest petition to Parliament against slavery. Right. Uh, against the slave trade. So um, you've got to get people involved in that deep way through their sense of who they are. The, the, the moral, I mean, the, 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 you, now, you need the moral arguments because their sense of who they are is, I'm on the right side, and I understand what the arguments are, right? So I'm not saying the morality stuff is irrelevant. You've got to have it. But until you connect it with people's sense of who they are, which I think you can do through these honor notions, through this sense of gaining a sense of entitlement to respect by being in the movement that's doing the right thing. Now, this can go wrong. I mean, it went wrong in this country in, in, um, in prohibition, right? The, the, these very same mechanisms led to a completely disastrous policy, which was fortunately, or unfortunately, it was so disastrous that, that we were able to do the very rare thing of undoing a constitutional right. amendment. Um, to, to put it right. Uh, so there's no guarantee that this mechanism can't be used to do bad things, uh, but I think it can be mobilized. You should look to do it. If you want to make, make a big change, if you want to get the arguments aligned, sure. Um, uh, so that you need to say that the current distribution of material wealth in the, in the world and in this country is preposterously immoral, and you need to explain why. Uh, both the mechanisms by which it's produced and the fact that it, it, it produces a world in which some people can't live uh, a life of uh, material dignity, right? Those are the th you need to know those things. But then you have to get yourself invested, and that means you have to work with other people. You can't do it on your own. It's not just a matter of sitting around and thinking something is wrong. It's not just a matter of writing a check to, to, to Oxfam or... or the ACLU or whatever it is, some organization that's doing something about one of the things you think is wrong, you've got to get engaged. And then, then there's a mechanism by which, um, you know, there are sort of cascades. So once, once enough people feel this way, then it becomes normal to feel this way, and then the people who don't feel this way feel left out, and, and they, they join in. Is this happening in relation to anti-racism? Uh, on verra, we will see. <laughs> I am, um, uh, I think, Backsliding is going on all over the place already from the promises that were made after the death of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd. Uh, on the other hand, I, I've been involved in things, in, in institutions that I think have done some important moves in anti-racist directions. But just a final point, just to agree with Adolf about something, um, If you do something for working people in this country, you're doing something for black working people and brown working people, but you're also doing something for white working people. Right. And um, that's, among other things, strategic, because there's a lot of them. Right. And if you can get the people who are really being, since we can say asshole, we can say screwed, <laughs> uh, if you get the people who are being screwed together, uh, 
instead of allowing themselves to be divided in part by, by race, racism, racial ideology isn't the only thing that divides people, but it's one of the things that divides people, um, then you, A, <laughs> you'll make life better for more people, and B, you have a better chance, I think, of actually creating a movement of the sort that will have this kind of positive right. sense of, I'm, I'm on the right side, I'm gonna work for this, that is necessary to turn an abstract moral notion into, into a change in social life. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to open it up to questions now, so it's time for people to ask whatever questions you might have. Oh, there we go. Hello. Uh, Hi. My name is Jaden. Uh, I guess a question that I have, especially since we're sitting in a college, um, is what the two of you uh, think about racial slurs and the use of racial slurs by people who are not um, a member of those groups, especially since the both of you have you know, argued that race, and have proven, I guess, um, that race is not a real thing. Um, and considering that language is also just made up and we apply meaning to it as we want, um, do you believe in the notion that people, only the groups affected by slurs or other types of racialized language should be the only groups using them? Um, and what has been the racial policy, the language policy in your own classrooms as you teach? Hmm. Well, yeah, that's an interesting question. But I say especially the last part. Um, well, so I've got like an official position and a pragmatic position, right? Uh, the pragmatic position is that <clears throat> if somebody hurls a racial slur at me, depending on the circumstances, I'll either hit him or I won't, right? Uh, so, but I mean, that's not, but that's not justifiable, right? I mean, that's, but, I mean, that's, that, that, that's an existential I mean, reflex that has to do with his, but, uh, I mean, history, upbringing, whatever. Um, the reason that I'm hesitating, though, about the question is that it, well, I know the question um, emerges from this particular historical moment, right? And it's not just on this campus, right? Like, it's, but, uh, I mean, it's all over. And I've, I've been um, disturbed, right, by the inflation of the language of trauma, right, and especially in, in the academic institutions over the last couple, three decades. And maybe this is just because I'm an old guy and, and I think about things like, what must have been like for Charles Johnson to go through the University of Chicago in 1920 and think, well, really? I mean. Um, but like the language, or um, so, and, and one problem that I have with the discourse of containing um, potentially offensive speech, right, is, is kind of, well, it feels parallel to me, ironically, to, you know, to the conservative judiciaries. Uh, focus on intent with, with respect to enforcement of, of the civil rights law, or worse, but with these, um, so, uh, 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 um, the so-called castle doctrine, or I mean the stand your ground laws, where, where all a perpetrator has, has to do is say that I felt threatened, and that I mean, justifies my killing but at a stranger who is but uh, who, who was unarmed and whom I have even possibly antagonized or assaulted, right? Uh, and, and, and there's just something about the, um, um, you know, the spread of, of this particular kind of, 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 of you know, discourse of, of, of individual or group dressed up as individual or category dressed up as group, and what a category dressed up as a group is, is a proxy for, for, for an individual, right? It's a bit of a digression, but I'll say, uh, and my son often makes this point, that the, that the black American population is, is, is the size of the population of Canada. And it, it's like useful to think about that for a second, right? So, and to consider that a statement that Canadians want X, is kind of preposterous on his face because we understand that there's 
there's you know, diversity and tensions and, and all kinds of differences that, that are compacted right, in this category Canadian. Blacks are the same thing, right? All right, so I'll close parens around that. So, but I don't know. I mean, what, I, mean I really don't know what, what, what the proper right, um, I mean, response is, and that's one reason I'm not an administrator. Uh, <laughs> I can think of a couple of others, possibly, but no, that's one for sure. Um, and I understand like it's kind of a minefield, but I do think it's like useful for us to take steps back from what is often enough like a potted discourse of hurt and trauma right, and offense and the rest. I mentioned a couple times today that, that, that when, that when I was a kid, right, well, uh, speaking of, of uh, being in Massachusetts, um, uh, but the Arthur Miller play, The Crucible, had like a central play, play, place in my family, right? Because like, like I grew up in the McCarthy era in, in a household that was concerned about it, right? <laughs> uh, and, and I've never lost that concern. And I sort of feel like moral panic is always ugly and frightening and, and, and potentially dangerous, whether it you know, starts from the left side of the bench or the right side of the bench. Uh, so I'm afraid, like, you've asked me basically what, what time it is, and I've given you, you know, disquisition on how to make a watch, but I got nothing better. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um. Well, I think this is, uh, you know, um, it's wrong to insult people. Right. Uh, and some insults, <laughs> some insults for certain purposes are more powerful than others because they stand in a history where the insult was associated with lynching, let's say. Right. And other insults are less painful because they don't have that history behind them. Decent and sensible people don't do that, don't use insults of that sort uh, against other people, and decent and sensible people know enough about if they live in this society to know which the ones are that do the damage and which the ones are that don't. Um, you asked whether uh, I thought it was okay for people in a group to use uh, words that if used against that group, would be a slur. That's a, I mean, the answer is yes, it can be okay, because mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's how queer got from being right. an insult to being an affirmative thing taken up by large numbers of people who are not uh, mainstream, straight, cis people. Uh, and that's the way the N-word is used in some African-American contexts. Yep. It's been turned into an expression of about brotherhood uh, in certain contexts. And um, now, do I think that um, so uh, in the context of the university and the college, um, insults are particularly damaging because in a classroom, we're thinking hard. We're already at the edge of our cognitive mm. capacities. And adrenaline and, and the sterols, the stress hormones, reduce even further your cognitive capacity. And so they make it hard to do the very thing that the class is for, which is to think hard at the edge of our capacities about things. I tell my students that if they feel offended by something, they should probably before they say or do anything, just stop and recognize that they're not in their best cognitive mm. frame of mind, that they're not going to be doing their best thinking. That's one of the things the insult may have done to them, so I'm not saying it's their fault, but it's a fact. And you've got to, self-knowledge is one of the things that uh, college education is supposed right. to increase. Right. So you've got to think about that. So I'm, you ask me, I don't, I, you know, I haven't even, even been, he's been chair of a department. <laughs> I've never even been chair of a department. So, uh, you know, 
know, I'd love no, to. I, I, oh, yeah, in fact, I haven't either. <laughs> okay, good. So that's why they asked us up here, because, uh, because they knew we, didn't know to, we couldn't administer our ways out of a paper bag. But, <laughs> right. So I don't know what I think the right solution is uh, in terms of, I, but I share with Adolf a sense that the language of uh, trauma and the language is essentially a language which treats the harm done by an insult as like a psychiatric trigger for someone who has been psycho psychologically damaged by having an explosion on the battlefield, real post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's an inflation. Uh, it's, it's insulting to people with PTSD right. to, to say, the, the, the bad feelings you have when someone insults you, insults you are like the reliving of a terrible experience that happens apparently to people with PTSD. That's, it, it's not that, it's bad, and I've just said you shouldn't do it to people, but it's not as serious as um, forcing a woman to relive an experience of sexual assault, right? Which you might do if you talked in certain ways about w women's bodies. Uh, even in a classroom, you might, you might do that. So, of course, you should be aware of all of this, but I don't think that, I, I think there has been an inflation of the sort that, yeah. that Adolf was talking about. And maybe I would say that the most worrying inflationary aspect of this is that it's not the biggest harm that's being done by race in our country today. Right. The biggest harm that's being done by race in our country today is being done to, is its role in obscuring mm -hmm the reality that we are doing a terrible job of dealing justly in the economy and in social life with people. Black people, yes, but people. And I, well, I'm not, uh, racism is real, and we need to do something about it, and Adolf isn't denying that. But he's saying that if you care about the people who are damaged by racism, uh, you might want to think that, they are, that their objective conditions would be improved if we did some things about their class position. And I agree with that. And I think, to some extent, the, the discourse about the N-word and so on is a distraction from that, right? So, yeah, it's bad to be, you know, be, be offensive, sure. But I'm not sure it's the, I think it takes too much, it take, it's taking up too much of our minds, this issue, when we should be thinking, with some of our minds at least, <laughs> about some other things that we're not thinking about, let me put it that way. Let's see if we can get one more question in, I think. Ross. Hi, I'm, I'm Ross. I was, um, Going back to Professor Shaw's question about the, um, the witch, it seemed like race was kind of like the witch as a myth. I was wondering, it seemed to me that you brought up this great example of uh, women in shelters in Ghana, and you said, well, you know, witchcraft is just present, people accuse of it, and it's, it, we need to talk about it. But it seems to me that if you take the perspective of the women in Ghana, if you say, if you refer to them as witches, it might seem in a way they would respond to you and say, in some way you've deeply misunderstood, by calling them witches, you've deeply misunderstood part of the problem, right? The, part of the problem is that they aren't witches. So what my, I guess my question is, would it, wouldn't it be helpful to not just black, kind of, seems like you're saying we should somewhat accept, right? Yes, race is a myth, but we, people, we, we talk about race, so we should, we just kind of need to accept these constructs and talk about it. Wouldn't it be at least helpful to correctly grasp the problem, to stop talking about, I, it might sound strange, but stop talking about black people, but maybe people accused of being black, maybe to, <laughs> use the <laughs> witch analogy. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, when I uh, sort of switched from to talking about racial identities, I thought that's what I was doing. I thought mm -hmm. what I was doing right. was saying, look, uh, again, to, to borrow from the sociologists here, people are racialized, they're treated in ways through these categories. We should, especially in the academy, demystify the categories. We should explain that the categories are mystifications and that they presuppose falsehoods. That's what it means to be a mystification. Uh, but we do need, uh, uh, we, you can't, um, we need to be able to talk about 
the ways in which uh, race does harm, and we need to be able to talk about the people that it harms, and the people it doesn't harm, and the people who play roles in causing that harm. And in our everyday social life, for the, for the purposes, for the languages of everyday life, uh, we use these racial categories to do that work. But, you know, we are also sitting in our classrooms telling people <laughs> how to understand right. these categories and saying, for example, that once you understand them correctly, there are questions you can't ask. Like, is, is President Obama really black? Right. This, is a, this, is, this is not a, uh, the answer is, anybody who knows anything serious about race knows that isn't a serious question. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, but, uh, but is he black? Sure. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, black for purposes of, uh, of uh, life at Pomona and Columbia and Harvard? Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, the places he went to school. Right. Uh, so. Yeah, well, I'll just add briefly I mean, but, but a couple things. One of them I apologize for in advance because it's a plug. But, um, <laughs> but um, I have a book that'll be out. Um, <laughs> Uh, at the beginning of February, and it's like an alternative to a memoir, but it's called, uh, it, well, but it's a rumination on the last two or three decades of, of everyday life in the Jim Crow South. And it's called uh, the South, uh, I'm Jim Crow and it's afterlives. But within it, the reason I mentioned, or the excuse I have for mentioning it now, um, is that there's a chapter in it on, on the notion of passing. Uh, and part of my argument is, and you know, like I said, I've, but I've got roots in, 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 in the South Louisiana where it's like not, not an anomalous practice, right? Um, but one, one of the points I make in it, 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 it is in addition to the fact that passing was often quite a mundane and, 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 uh, and, and instrumental act, like to get a box of beignets, right, from a store that wouldn't let, let, let blacks in or that kind of thing. And I mean, not at all the stuff of what well, the overheated well, yeah. the accounts in, in fiction and films and the like. But also that the defeat of the Jim Crow era made passing obsolete, right? Because there were no stakes attached to being black anymore, right? Not what, I mean, not the material stakes that there had been but, but under the Austrian regime. And one of the problems uh, in contemporary what, I mean, discourse about race is a tendency to, um, to adduce um, clearly racial crimes and sins in the past from slavery or, or uh, Jim Crow to work in lieu of explanation for, for claims that, that structural inequalities that produce disparate outcomes by race are in fact to be understood as racism, okay? Um, uh, but, but I wanted the po po point to make, well, two quick points. One, well, one about trauma is, um, what, you know, my sense is that in contemporary I mean, discourse about the, you know, the traumatic effects of, of you know, slights and insults hinges on what's almost like a Jungian right, understanding of racial memory. Right, so that what makes me think of slavery traumatizes me, and, and I'm coming to a more radical view of what of this idea of heritage, that your heritage is, is uh, what's happened to you when you were alive, <laughs> right? Uh, and when my son, who also can be an asshole, um, <laughs> was a TA when he was in graduate school, when, 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 when students would, would submit papers, that, um, that use the first person plural to uh, discuss, uh, you know, sharecropping or slavery. He's, he's writing the margin. So were you alive in 1880? <laughs> but, but, but also, like, what went up, you know, like when he was in college, a couple of miles up the road, uh, he, 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 uh, he gave an update to the Du Bois uh, what, um, what line about who a black man is, and his update was that you are well, what the police think you are. And that can solve the racial identity question. <laughs> Thanks, you've given us a lot to chew on. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you all.